Have you ever heard of people describe their love for sugar as an addiction? Well, they might be onto something. So it's a secondary addiction to a primary emotional addiction. You have to ask yourself, what emotion am I addicted to? According to research, there is now strong evidence supporting the notion that hyperpalatable foods, notably those high in added sugar, can induce reward and craving that are at least comparable to addictive drugs. Three tangible reasons why people do not use sugar. Fear of obesity, fear of caries, and fear of diabetes. Those words are from a speech called What's New in Sugar Research by Dr. Henry Bourne Haas, an award-winning American specialist in organic chemistry. He gave that speech back in 1954. Back then, 52-year-old Haas was the president of the Sugar Research Foundation, later renamed Sugar Association. He went on to tell his audience of sugar technologists. We are in an era, almost unique in world history, when in the United States and a certain few other favored countries, there's more food available than people can eat. Each food industry has to get up and fight for its place in the limited human stomach. And fight he would. First, he announced that members of the SRF had voted unanimously to spend $600,000 per year for at least three years to tell a positive story of sugar in the diet. At last, people who never had a course in biochemistry are going to learn that sugar is what keeps every human being alive and with energy to face our daily problems. And so began the SRF's all-out offensive in defense of sugar which would see it finance hundreds of studies that presented sugar in a favorable light. For a good number of these studies, the foundation did not disclose its involvement and funding. Exhibit A, Project 226, a study which was published in 1967 by the New England Journal of Medicine. The Harvard researchers behind it, who were paid $6,500 by SRF at the time, did not disclose the funding. More importantly, their research concluded that dietary fat and cholesterol were the greater causes of heart disease, and that sugar played a minimal role. Even as research to the contrary was beginning to emerge, studies such as these would go on to drive the low-fat craze that peaked in the 1980s, where many food manufacturers reduced fat and added sugar. To be fair, high sugar consumption is now a global phenomenon and the SRF cannot be held solely responsible for that. However, some of the world's top purveyors of sugar products are US companies, such as the Coca-Cola Company, PepsiCo, Mars, and Mondelez International. Add to that the global reach of US fast food chains, such as KFC, McDonald's, and Burger King, and a picture of the US influence on the global diet becomes obvious. So, what is new in sugar research? Well, the World Health Organization's sugar guidelines strongly recommended that free sugars in the diet be reduced to no more than 10% of daily intake. That's roughly 50 grams or 12 teaspoons of sugar. And that amount includes sugars added to food and drinks by manufacturers or cooks, as well as those present in honey, syrups, fruit juices, and fruit juice concentrates. They also suggested a further reduction to less than 5% of daily intake, roughly 25 grams or 6 teaspoons. And everything can change once a person is aware of themselves, both their strengths and their shortcomings. Then you can work with that. And often one has to work with replacing a crutch with something that's more constructive and beneficial and not as self-destructive. 